Uh, welcome back, everyone, uh, to the final day of the Fields Metal Symposium for Peter Schulze. So I'm very happy to uh, introduce Dustin Clausen uh, for the first talk this morning from the University of Copenhagen. And he's going to tell us about new foundations for functional analysis. Great. Um, thanks, uh, Fargo. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak here, which I consider a, um, a really big honor. Um, well, I just want to say just a word at the beginning, um, kind of on a personal note. I mean, I'm, I feel like I've been very fortunate throughout my life as a mathematician to get the chance to interact with a lot of amazing people as teachers and mentors and collaborators. But uh, for me, the, the highlight of everything so far has been um, my interactions with Peter and the fact that he you know, sort of took some of my crazier ideas seriously and kind of made them his own and did wonderful things with them. Uh, that just meant so much to me and kind of put me in a good mood for several years. <laughs> so thanks a lot, Peter. Um, right, so I want to talk about some joint work we did uh, kind of reimagining foundations for functional analysis. So let me start by recalling what we could, I guess, call the usual setup for functional, for functional analysis. Um, so it's, it's, you sort of do everything in this framework of topological real vector spaces. Um, and oftentimes you want to single out a sort of a, a full subcategory here that your natural objects live in. And usually the kind of adjectives people like to work with are complete and locally convex. Uh, topological real vector spaces. Um, and what we're going to do is, so we're going to replace this uh, picture by the following picture. So we're going to have condensed um, our, and for some reason I like to say our modules instead of our vector spaces, but, um, and then inside here we'll have, well, there's a parameter P, but never mind that. So P liquid are modules. Um, and why, well, why did we want to do this? Why, why was this sort of a little bit inconvenient? Well, one thing that's not so nice about this is that it's uh, not in a billion category. So it can be very confusing doing algebra in this category um, because you can't apply your usual rules and you have to be very careful about topological phenomena and so on. That's one thing. And another thing is that there are many ten tensor products, many different notions of completed tensor product. Um, and so you're really kind of, yeah, it's kind of a bewildering, bewildering kind of place to do work if you're used to just doing pure algebra. Um, whereas in this case, um, it is an abelian category. In fact, it's a very nice abelian category. I'll be a little more specific about that in a second. Uh, and there's only one tensor product, really, uh, complete tensor product. So there's everything is sort of more canonical and behaves nicer from an algebraic perspective. But OK, if this was a complete departure from this, then it maybe wouldn't be so interesting. because We know lots of natural examples of things like this. And we don't want to just have to throw them away when we go to our new framework. So another important point is that a lot of familiar examples here also live here and interact very nicely with this structure. So let me just single out, uh, these words may not be so familiar, uh, but let me just signal out there's a very uh, big and common class of these guys called nuclear crochet spaces. And those sit both in here and in here and the tensor product, the completed tensor products are the same. So things like rings of smooth functions or holomorphic functions are good examples of nuclear crochet spaces. Um, so we're not, yeah, so not, a common theme of this will, that will be that if you have a favorite example of something in the topological setting, you can move it over here and just work with it over here instead, and your life will only improve. <laughs> um, okay, so that's kind of the outline, but actually I'm going to do a little switcheroo. Um, I'm probably not going to touch, talk much about this uh, liquid setup here, mostly because it's very complicated, um, but I'll talk about a, a non-Archimedean analog. So. Okay. 
And I could stick with um, you know QP or some non-Archimedean local field instead of R, but when you're doing the non-Archimedean world, you might as well take the base ring to be Z. So then I'll say the non-Archimedean analog is just uh, condensed abelian groups. Uh, and then inside that of something we call solid abelian groups. Uh, which you just to think of as analogous to the kind of classical um, notion of a complete uh, linearly topologized uh, abelian group. Um, so the kinds of topological abelian groups that would show up when you're doing non-Archimedean geometry or non-Archimedean functional analysis. Um, this is just an analogy, although, yeah, again, many of the many there there are many the examples are com, lots of com, lots of examples are common in the two frameworks, although the general notions that emerge. Um, okay, so now part of the whole mantra of this game is that the, well, the reason these usual functional analytic categories are not suitable for doing algebra really actually really goes back to a problem with topological spaces. The topological spaces aren't really suitable for mixing with algebra, in spite of the fact that, of course, <laughs> there are many, many works that successfully mix them with algebra. But still, on a fundamental level, it's a little bit awkward because topological spaces talk about open subsets, you know, collections of subsets for your set, and that interaction with algebraic structure is actually not so clean. Um, so, uh, we kind of want to go very back to the beginning and find a replacement for topological spaces, um, which will have, which will make it easier to mix with algebra. And then we'll build all this structure on top of this notion of condensed set, the replacement for the notion of topological space. So I'll just start there. Um, maybe I can erase the title by now. Um, so, uh, so condensed sets. And just to give, just to reiterate the idea, so the idea of these is that they capture topological phenomena. But are sort of structurally or category, you know, the category of them is similar to the category of sets in terms of its formal properties. Um, so, uh, and well, well, that's the, the sort of what we're looking for, what is the idea of the definition? So instead of studying, so try to encode a topological space X, a topological space X uh, just by recording for all profinite sets, so called profinite sets S. So that means that S is a inverse limit uh, of finite sets. Uh, finite discrete sets, and then S gets the inverse limit topology, so it's some compact, totally disconnected space. Um, uh, the set of continuous maps from uh, S to X. So you only care about the topological space in as much as how you can map profinite sets into it. That's the basic idea. Now, so why why does this record enough information? Well, it's due to two sort of, it's due to the combination of two separate phenomena. Yes, why should maps from profinite sets into your topological space remember enough about a topological space? Um, so, the, the first phenomenon is that if X is compact Hausdorff, uh, then there exists a surjection. A surjective continuous map from S to X, where S is a profinite set. And every surjective continuous map like that is actually a quotient map. Um, so uh, you can kind of cover any compact Hausdorff space by something profinite. More generally, you can resolve any compact Hausdorff space by profinite things. And the second phenomenon is that for many, many X are such that. The compact subsets, the compact Hausdorff subsets, uh, 
from the topology. So for example, well, certainly if you're locally compact power store, so e.g. any manifold, uh, or if you're just metrizable, that's enough. Because then, in fact, well, you, you only need the one point compactification of the natural numbers. That profinite set or that compact house space to determine the topology. Um, and so, we, and examples of these are, yeah, in the context of functional analysis, any Frechet space, any Bonnach space, um, many, many possible examples. Um, so, when you combine these two things, you see that for lots of X, um, it's enough to just record the data of continuous maps from a profinite set. You don't lose any information. Um, now, let me make this a little more formal here. Um, oh, wait, I wanted to, to give one example of this. This might seem a little funny if, you, if you've never seen it before, but actually there's a very familiar example, which I think Jared talked about in his very impressive uh, uh, lecture to the general audience. Um, so if you take this, uh, okay, a compact house door space, you might not think is very similar at all to a profinite set is the unit interval from zero to one, but here's a profinite set, this product of, I don't know, uh, digits in a base uh, 10 expansion product indexed by the natural numbers. And there's a continuous map which sends this collection of digits to point first digit, second digit, et cetera, et cetera. And it's surjective. Um, all right. Okay, so now let me give the formal discussion of condensed sets. So the definition, uh, a condensed set uh, is a functor opposite of the category of cofinite sets, the sets, and let's call this functor X such that um, it's a sheaf uh, for the canonical topology. On profinite set on this category of profinite sets. Well, we can spell out what that means. So, first condition is sort of very basic that if you evaluate X on a finite disjoint union of profinite sets, that should be the same with the product of uh, X of the SI. So, mapping from each of these separately uh, should be the same as mapping from their disjoint union. That makes sense. Um, and the second thing is uh, if S prime projects onto S, uh, then X of S maps isomorphically to the equalizer of X of S prime, and then two different pullback maps to S prime, S prime crossover S S prime. Um, and uh, the um, so what the previous What's discussion the difference between pinning and spotlight. Could you say that again? Was that a question? I think somebody said that your video should be spotlighted or something like this, which is it's not- spotlighted right now. Okay. okay. Should, should I continue then? You can continue, yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So kind of the informal discussion we had before turns into, so if you have a, so if X is a, yeah, so, so if, uh, you can make a functor from, sorry, from compactly generated topological spaces. Those are the ones where the topology is determined by compact house door spaces mapping in. Um, and this embeds sort of fully faithfully into condensed sets by sending X to what's known as X underline, where X underline of S uh, is equal to uh, instead of continuous maps from S to X. So this is just now, we can make formal now this informal observation that for a large class of topological spaces, it's sufficient to view them as condensed sets. Okay, so that in some sense explains the second desideratum of our theory of condensed sets, that it should contain a lot of topological phenomena in it. But what about the first one? So why is condensed sets similar to sets from a category perspective? Well, also here, there are two aspects to this. Um, I 
And the first aspect is, well, it's a, it's a topos. Okay, I'm, I'm neglecting cardinality issues here. Please don't bug me about it. <laughs> so, uh, so insofar as she's on any topological space, she's a set on any topological space, for example, looks like the category of sets. So does condensed sets. So formally, I guess this is the like, finite limits interactive co-limits just like in sets but it's actually much much simpler than a general topos because it also has enough compact projectors um, and uh, rather than say explicitly what this means let me just uh, say a few things in the neighborhood of what this means so <laughs> Uh, so these are the uh, S that are not just profinite, but extremely disconnected profinite. Uh, um, so, and in fact, so uh, you can sort of, I said you can simplify any compact house door space by surjecting on it from, to, uh, onto it from a profinite. You can sort of, in some sense, simplify even further by surjecting onto that from an extremely disconnected. And this tells you uh, that condensed sets uh, are also the same thing as uh, functors from uh, extremely disconnected off uh, sets. And then the nice thing that happens with extremely disconnected things is that they're kind of projective in the category of compact house doors. And that means you can actually completely ignore the second more complicated descent condition in the definition of condensed sets. So you just have that X of a disjoint union of SIs, a finite disjoint union should be the finite product of the SIs. And so it's really it's the <laughs> the sheet condition is really really simple, and so there's not much difference between a condensed set and just a, some family of sets with maps between them. Uh, so uh, and these yeah these become sort of the compact projective generators. Okay, so uh, let me make now a remark. So. Uh, so these condensed sets. Well, that's another name for this. It's just the same definition, is that it's uh, sheaves on the pro tall site of a point. And this uh, this idea of looking at sheaves on defining pro tall sites and looking at sheaves on them was, of course, pioneered by Schulze in his well, one of his papers on piadic Hodge theory. Uh, one of his early papers on piadic Hodge theory. Um, so that was in the, not the context of uh, non Archimedean geometry. But then there was in, in thought Schulze, they moved it to schemes. Uh, and then in Schulze later, it was done in the context of, well, I, I don't know, I'll sort of, I'll say in the diamonds context. So, well, she was on perfectoid spaces in character GP. This is, this is where there's the closest analogy. But formally speaking, there's uh, there's all these similarities here, and um, I would very much like to say that you know the, <laughs> the idea behind studying condensed sets came from these sources. Maybe for Peter that's true. It's not quite true for me. I actually had a different, completely different set of motivations which led me to this, and then it was just a fortuitous kind of coincidence that it fit into this nice picture here. Um, but certainly you can see the, <laughs> the impressive list of uh, subjects that Peter has done that touch on this idea. Um, okay, so now I want to pass from condensed sets to uh, condensed abelian groups. So we're going to start moving towards functional analysis. So we should first put just a abelian group structure. So. So what is this? Well, I guess in, in the language, in this language I just said, it's, uh, it's sheet, probably tall sheaves of abelian groups. Or another way of saying it is it's just abelian group objects in condensed sets. So, um, and then these nice properties of condensed sets translate into nice properties of condensed abelian groups. So this is a, an abelian category, but again, of a particularly nice type. So, well, it has all, I don't know, all direct sums and all products. Um, and it's a general feature of sheet category that these are always exact. 
It's very much not a general feature of sheet categories that these are always exact, but in this case it is, thanks to uh, the compact projectives. So with enough compact projectives. And those are the free condensed abelian groups on the extremely disconnected finite sets. And the existence of these guys um, gives all, all sorts of good exactness properties. Just lets you reduce all exactness questions to abelian groups. Um, so it behaves remarkably a lot like the category of abelian groups, but yet it encodes topological phenomena. Um, so, and one of the things you can, and again, yes, it's, it's not, so having enough projectives, let alone enough compact projectives, is very much not a feature of a general sheaf category. And it tells you that you can, you know, so you can, can do homological algebra sort of as usual using projective resolutions as opposed to injective resolutions. And projective resolutions tend to kind of be more in a way concrete. Um, so the first test of, of this formalism is really whether um, you know, homological calculations work out in this category. So we already, um, and so the, the first result we proved, which showed that this was the case, was the following. Um, so theorem. Uh, so I'll take A and B to be locally compact abelian groups. So this could be things like Q, P, R, uh, product of copies of the compact abelian group, or you know, Adels, I don't know. So you, you can can't wear anything discrete. Yeah. Uh, then you can calculate the x in all degrees uh, in the in this uh, category of condensed abelian groups from a underline to b underline, uh, and you get sort of the simple expected answer. So in degree zero, uh, you get the homs from a to b. In degree one, you get the x from a to b. X in this category, so it's extensions of locally compact abelian groups from between A and B. And then you get zero when I is bigger than one. And uh, this is well a, a fairly non-trivial result because again, a priori to calculate such X, you need to make resolutions. And these resolutions are actually quite these extremely disconnected, they're very funny topological spaces. You can, it's very hard to make it. Uh, get your hand on them, and it's, so I mean I don't know. So you have to do some work to prove this, and the fact that it all works out so cleanly in the end was for me a, a big indication that we were on the right track. Um, but um, it is by far uh, I was personally by far not convinced yet by this because we were still missing one important uh, ingredient, which is crucial for all sorts of applications of condensed abelian groups to any kind of ordinary mathematical question. So what was really missing uh, was a notion of completeness and a completion functor. So next. Uh, any completeness condition. So, well, why do we need that? So I'll give more reasons later, uh, uh, but but one is one major one is a uh, uh, we need a complete a completed tensor product. Um, so I don't know. Whenever you're doing a, you know mixing your geometry with functional analysis, it's not tensor algebraic tensor product that comes up. It's some kind of completed tensor product, right? Um, so we need to know what that is supposed to be in this abstract context. Um, and so condensed abelian groups has a tensor product, has a natural tensor product with, um, with the usual rules of operation for how it behaves, but it doesn't, but it's not complete. So if you take two condensed abelian groups and take their tensor product in condensed abelian groups, and you look at the underlying abelian group, which is implemented by evaluating on the one point space, then you actually just see the algebraic tensor product of these guys here. So you're just putting some funky but topology and condensed structure on this algebraic tensor product, which, for example, if you took 
like QP, hence our QP is just some really big weird thing, right? Not a reasonable object. For the completed tensor product, you'd like to get this QP back again, but you don't with this. So it needs to be completed. Um, and then once we had this, then it was clear that we had a good theory. So let me explain what the, the completion functor is. Um, so, but I should, I should um, emphasize that it's not a completion functor that's appropriate for all situations, it's rather a non archimedean It's called solidification. So that's um, the next uh, thing I want to explain. Um, so it's based on the following definition. Um, so so it S, let S be a profinite set. Then we define uh, Z solid uh, bracket S. It's supposed to be the solidification of the free guy Z bracket S. We define it to be, well, if you write S as an inverse limit of finite sets, then this is defined to be the inverse limit of the Z brackets those finite sets. This is just a finite direct sum of copies of Z indexed by I, it's discrete. And then you take the inverse limit in the category of condensed to be in groups. It's uh, of course no longer discrete, it's some sort of inverse limit topology. Um, and that is supposed to be the solidific, the free solid uh, abelian group on S. Um, uh, so we basically just put the Z on the inside of the inverse limit. That feels like completion, right? Um, so, uh, and then uh, for A in condensed abelian groups, uh, we say A is solid. If for all S in profinite sets, uh, the map from you can take palms from this complete guy to A, and you can restrict them uh, to Z bracket S. There's a natural map from here to here. Uh, this is, of course, just A of S, so this goes free. And this map you demand to be a bijection. Um, so, well, one other interpretation of this. Uh, is that it's actually the dual to, uh, so it's like internal hom from continuous functions to Z. So you can actually think of it as a kind of space of measures on SI. We call them solid measures on SI. Uh, whereas this Z bracket S, uh, this is only sort of finite sums of Dirac measures. It's just so, sort of, you just algebraically form Z bracket S. So to speak, with no completeness. And this is a so this is kind of saying that A is complete enough that you can integrate functions along measures. So if you have a, a function of S with values in A and you have a measure, then you can evaluate and get you can integrate, you can get an element in A. Um, so that can give you some degree of intuition for this. Um, okay, now let me state the main theorem on these definitions. So, so here, so solid, uh, solid abelian groups inside condensed abelian groups is closed under all limits and co-limits. In particular, it's an abelian category. It's closed under kernels and co-kernels. Um, in fact, uh, yeah, solid Q is not just a abelian category, it's as nice an abelian category as condensed abelian groups was, so it has enough compact projectives. And these are given by these Z bracket uh, S's, uh, which by the way, turn out to be abstractly isomorphic to just some product of copies of Z. Um, for any profinite set S, this guy, is, well, not, for non obvious reasons, is just a product of copies of C. So, those are the compact projectives in uh, solid abelian groups. In other words, everything is a co kernel of a map between direct sums of copies of such a guy. That's, and, and these are 
projective and compact. So that's how you present everything is by direct sums of, of those types of things. Um, right. Uh, uh, the third thing I said was closed under all limits and co-limits, but it's also closed under extensions. Uh, and even higher extensions. In fact, well, what do I mean by that? I mean that even uh, the, the derived category, if you take derived categories here, um, and even this is fully faithful. So it's a very, very it's very a very robust subcategory of condensed being groups. Once you're in there, it's very hard to leave, right? That's um, yeah. Um, and the last thing I want to say is that so for all condensed abelian groups, there, there exists an initial solid abelian group, a solid uh, with a map. It goes to a solid. So this is this solidification. So it's the you just make a become solid in a minimal way. So for example, uh, you take Z bracket S and you solidify it. That is this thing I call the Z uh, solid S, which is essentially a restatement of the definition once you know this facts. Okay, so um, let me give some examples of solid things, and then I'll make some just dis some discussion and examples of this solidification functor. So. So, uh, well, first of all, uh, if you have an ordinary uh, abelian group viewed as kind of a discrete abelian group, that sit inside, sits inside condensed abelian groups, but in fact, it sits inside solid abelian groups. So anything discrete is solid. Um, well, inverse limits of discrete things are solid, so. The solid is closed under limits, and then you can take co-limits of that. You can take inverse limits, of <laughs> and then you can actually alternate and keep going and take co-limits of limits and whatever, and you'll always be in solid, right? This is me saying that solid is closed under all limits and co-limits. So examples here would be you can complete a, a discrete ring with respect to an ideal, so inverse limit of r mod i to the n, and that's not discrete anymore, but it's still solid. And then you could even, if you want, invert some element, and then you could complete as something else and Take an infinite direct sum and complete again, and you know, take a product of those and invert something. You get the picture, right? <laughs> you know. Uh, and every time something non-trivial is happening, but you're still solid. Okay. Um, so let me give a more specific example. Uh, so any Fréchet space over a QT is solid. <laughs> And you could just sort of say how to integrate measures, like verify the definition, but it's maybe easier to say that this is some inverse limit of Banach spaces, uh, some countable inverse limit of Banach spaces, and that a Banach space is, you know, direct sum of copies of Z, P completed, and then invert P. So you start with something discrete, you complete it, you invert something, it's still solid. Um, okay. Um, now, so these are all examples of solid things. And like I said, you should think anything that complete with respect to some linear topology is probably going to be solid. Um, now let me make some discussion of the diverse roles of solidification. So, So rule number one is the solid tensor product. This is defined to be, so you take two solid abelian groups, uh, you take their tensor product in condensed abelian groups and then you solidify it. Um, so that gives a, a nice symmetric monoidal structure on uh, on solid abelian groups, 
and it uh, preserves co-limits in each variable. That makes it algebraically very much like a usual tensor product in some category of modules, right? Um, and then to further specify what it does, since everything can be resolved by these compact projectives, uh, you need to know what happens on the compact projectives. And this is what makes it look like a completed tensor product. So uh, this thing becomes just product I cross J. Uh, Z. So when I do this, uh, solid tensor product. Um, now, so what does this mean? It means that to calculate the solid tensor product, you it does this on the generators and then it's extended by co-limits. Now, here's a remarkable fact. It's defined basically to preserve co-limits and then this on the compact projective generators, but it turns out to commute with limits in an unusually large number of situations. Like, which do not obviously follow from this fact, because if you plug in something which is built from huge co limits from these, but nonetheless, it still commutes with limits. Very strange. You have to just, just sit down and calculate to see that it's true. Um, let me give some examples. Um, so, starting with less shocking and moving on to perhaps more shocking, I don't know. Uh, so, uh, you can do QP tensor QL, for example. Uh, solid tensor product. It's another notation for the solid tensor product. And as you might expect, this is zero if p is different from L and qp if p is equal to L. So it really does feel like a, it's implementing a completed tensor product there. Um, another thing is that if, yeah, if v and w are for shape spaces over L, over qp, then this uh, solid tensor product is the usual projective tensor product, which means it commutes with the in inverse limits defining for shape spaces in terms of, terms of Banach spaces. Um, and then on Banach spaces, it also commutes with the completion there, uh, which is an inverse limit. So that is a little, uh, a little shocking, but it's an instance of this general thing I said. And even more abstractly, I guess I could, uh, here's an abstract thing which is very useful. So if M and N are any P complete uh, solid abelian groups, uh, then the solid tensor product is also P complete. Well, or at least maybe I've only really shown it's derived P complete, but there's barely any difference, so never mind. Um, so that means you can, if you're, if you have two p complete things, the tensor product is p complete. So you can calculate it by reducing mod p. Um, it commutes with that inverse limit if you had a completion. That's very funny that, that it's true, but yeah, you just have to sit and check. Um, so this was one rule of this solidification: is it gives you a completed tensor product, which sort of matches with what you would want out of your completed tensor product in non-Archimedean situations. Um, and but yet yeah, behaves algebraically formally like a algebraic tensor product. So kind of best of all worlds. But it actually has several other rules. And this is kind of, I think, kind of fascinating. Uh, so, so other rules for solidification. These are going to be a little bit strange, maybe. So one is the following. So I, Another place where you see things you'd really like rather be complete is an algebraic K theory. And uh, you can take, for example, the algebraic K theory of ZP, and you see all sorts of crazy stuff starting from K2. Um, but you can view this as a condensed spectrum, and solidification also makes sense in that context. And it should be some nice completion. And in fact, it is. So it turns out this is the same thing as the inverse limit of the K theory of Z mod Q, the NZs, which is kind of the reasonable approximation to this. Uh, which contains all the reasonable information, but is actually describable. Uh, no weird stuff. Um, so it also implements completion in this context, commuting with K theory. So that's kind of fun. Um, another thing. Ah, so here's a fun example. So and I think every talk is part of the contract. You have to mention something to do with perfectoids. So here's where <laughs> here's where I'll, where I'll do that. Uh, so let's say we take a perfectoid field. Now recall that, I mean, the reason it's called perfectoid is in the first part is it's analogous in some sense to just a perfect field K of characters to P. 
So there's an analogy there, but there are also differences, right? So one difference is this can be a mixed characteristic where this is always in characteristic E, but maybe the major difference is that this is discrete. Fermi field is just with a discrete topology, but a perfectoid field is a non-Archimedean field. So you have to remember its evaluation or its topology or, well, uh, its condensed structure, if you like, or its structure as a solid, um, solid frame. Um, so I want to give an example where the solid framework lets you do things that you maybe thought you could only go over here, um, let you do them over here too. So here's a nice, uh, so we probably are all somewhat familiar with the bit vectors, but there's kind of an abstract way of getting the bit vectors, which is you, you can calculate the cotangent complex of the, your perfect field over the integers, and you find that it's just got a single class in degree one. And this implies by some formal considerations that there, uh, there is a universal uh, pro nilpotent thickening uh, of K and it's one parameter. And this is a uh, bit vectors of K, mapping back down to K. Uh, now over here, you can take the cotangent complex of F over the integers and this will be a condensed abelian group. So just on S value points, you just take the cotangent complex of, of F of S over Z of S, um, but it won't be solid, it won't be complete. So you need to complete it. But when you complete it, uh, you find that this is also just F sitting in degree one. And again, because the solid theory behaves algebraically, just like this theory, it, it implies by the same arguments that there's a universal uh, uh, pro nilpotent of F in solid rings, so ring objects in solid abelian groups, and it's got again one parameter. And this is a you know Fontaine's BDR plus. And you know, sort of automatically produce it with the correct topology or condensed structure, just kind of for formal reasons. Um, okay. Uh, Great. So I'll give a third role for solidification, which was kind of fun for us, I think. Um, well, so I said it's a, it behaves like a kind of non Archimedean completion contract. So you can ask what happens when you put in something Archimedean, right? So, um, uh, well, the most basic example when you take this locally compact abelian group. It's condensed, but it's not solid. And in fact, it turns out that its solidification is zero. Okay, that should maybe make sense of Archimedean and non-Archimedean. Um, but you can kind of go further. You could use, so there's this short exact sequence. Uh, and solidification, uh, you know, connects with co-kernels. So while well, you deduce that R mod Z solidified is also zero. Um, so it you know, turns this circle into zero as well, but this is not the whole story because uh, solidification is not exact. It has left derived functors. Um, and if you are careful about that, so if you take the derived solidification, um, uh, I guess L this, then you'll find that it, it has just an H1 and that H1 is Z. So in other words, this is just Z shifted up by one. And that's because this is zero, and so the solidification of this is just this up to a shift. Um, so what's happening here is that somehow this uh, this circle here is kind of you're seeing the homology of this circle in some sense popping or, or homotopy of this circle maybe popping up as a, a z in the next degree. So there is a more general instance of this phenomenon, or a more fundamental, I should say, instance of this phenomenon. Um, so if you take a, let's say a CW complex, which is an example of the kind of thing that sits fully faithfully in condensed abelian groups, it's an example of something uh, compactly generated. Um, then, well, you can take the free condensed abelian group on X. Condensed sets. What? Condensed oh, thank sets. You, thank you. Yes. Yes. You can take the free condensed abelian group on X and it's again, just like Dirac, sums of Dirac, finite sums of Dirac measures on X and it's not complete or so solid and you can solidify it. And if here you get the, 
usual zero integral homology of z. Um, but if you take the derived solidification uh, and you take hi, uh, so then you actually get the, uh, the full knowledge of the integral homology. So in other words, this complex here computes the uh, integral homology of your CW complex. So another rule for solidification is it sort of passes to homotopy. So it passes to homotopy type. So I thought it was very fun that yeah, the same functor uh, does yeah, different things for you in this way. Uh, yeah, both non archimedean or somehow says that you should think of non archimedean completion and passing to homotopy type is very closely related. Um, okay, so now I have a surprising amount of time left. Right, good. So, uh, so I haven't maybe yet said much about functional analysis. Um, so, for me, one of the one of the impetuses to think about functional analysis was its interaction with, um, uh, I think for Peter, maybe even more than me, uh, was the interaction with analytic geometry. Um, so let me just recall kind of a, a classical statement. So uh, there's stereo duality uh, for smooth, uh, proper, rigid analytic spaces. So, Let's say we have X, a smooth, proper, rigid analytic space, and um, E, a vector bundle. Uh, then um, you, look, you can look at the yeah, um, cohomology of X with coefficients in E. Uh, this is dual to, this is a finite dimensional vector space. And it's dual to uh, H dimension minus I. Uh, x uh, e tensor with uh, you know some dualizing object. Um, uh, e dual, sorry. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is all all well and good, but outside the proper case. So outside, if you drop proper, which I mean, kind of you often want to do, so. Uh, then, then this becomes more complicated. So, well, first of all, uh, H i x e are not finite dimensional. So you could try viewing them in the topological context, um, but then there's a problem that uh, they're not even Hausdorff, so they're not necessarily Hausdorff. I mean, so what's going on here? You can always populate this kind of thing with a check complex uh, from an affinoid cover, um, but then in the check complex, each term will just be a Banach space. But then the differentials might not have closed image. And so when you pass to the cohomology, you could be seeing something very funny the topological, the notion of topological vector space is not very well equipped to handle. Um, so, and it kind of makes it uh, annoying to try to state a version of a uh, stereo duality, which applies outside the proper case. Um, but well, once you have this solid formalism, you can do it without any problem. So let me state a, a result. So. Uh, so, so for for a, a rigid analytic space, X, and let's again just say a vector bundle uh, E over X, there exists a natural uh, compactly supported cohomology. So Highly supported coherent cohomology, which is maybe a little funny, um, such that uh, if x is proper, oh, sorry, if x is smooth, uh, uh, then uh, so this is going to be a solid abelian group. Um, then Homs, uh, uh, sorry, R Homs from this R gamma. QP is just uh, R gamma um, 
uh, x equal tensor omega d uh, d. Right. So you have the per I mean, this is me expressing the dual. Uh, I won't say perfect duality, but you have at least in this direction. But on our homes out of this is the same thing as global sections. Um, and moreover, uh, uh, this, these derived functors are not scary. <laughs> so, uh, what do I mean by that? I mean, so even in the situations where this is a non house sort thing, if X satisfies some very mild sort of countability of cover hypothesis, then there was always going to be at most one x. So there'd be at most an x1 from this guy to q t. There'd be a home and an x1 at most, but no higher x. So this derived duality really just breaks up into short exact sequences, much like if you, if you look at Poincare duality for a singular cohomology of manifolds with integer coefficients. So there it's even with these crazy non house store things, and our formalism works just fine, and you get a duality which is no more complicated than something that people are very adept at dealing with. Um, and in the proper case, this cohomology with compact supports reduces to just usual cohomology and you get uh, serial duality. Um, yeah, and this should be some internal R home, I guess, and this is also solid. It should be in derived solid. I want to give you just, just an idea of what this compactly supported cohomology functor looks like. So I'll do one example. And I think um, I probably don't have time to say anything about liquid back. Well, we'll see. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll say a word about liquid things at the end. Um, so let's do the example of the unit disk. And let's just say it is trivial. Um, so then what the idea is for this uh, compactly supported cohomology of the open unit disk is that uh, so it should be a sort of functions on X on D, sorry, relative to an, relative to a neighborhood of infinity. Um, so you look at your closed unit disk and you want to say you take all functions here and you do a relative to uh, kind of functions on the boundary. Um, and what does this look like? So this looks like a two term complex where you just have the usual ring of rigid analytic functions on the unit disk and then functions kind of at the boundary of the unit disk. So this is the usual paid algebra. So um, some cn t to the n, uh, where n is greater than or equal to zero and cn goes to zero as n goes to infinity. And this one here um, is some cn t to the n where n is an arbitrary integer, cn goes to zero as n goes to plus infinity, and cn bounded as n goes to minus infinity. Um, and you can kind of just, well, I guess I could also try to write it algebraically. So direct sum of n greater than or equal to zero uh, z p one over p, or is this is, or maybe z bracket t actually, right? Z bracket t. Uh, P completed one over P, and this is Z Laurent series and T inverse completed at P one over P. Um, and if you look at this, you see that this map is clearly injective, and that there's a but there's a co-kernel which consists sort of of the negative part of an expression like this. And then you can actually see that the, the these conditions of being bounded and, and tending to zero are dual to each other in the appropriate sense. When you take duals, you get the correct thing. Um, so that's the yeah that's the idea behind this and actually in fact there's a whole six functor formalism for coherent cohomology or quasi coherent cohomology in fact in this setup um, which this is just an instance of um, so let me end by saying a few words about this liquid theory not much um, actually you know what no let's just stop right here <laughs> um. Okay, uh, let's uh, thank Dustin for the wonderful lecture. And since Dustin graciously ended early, we have a lot of time for, for questions.
Now it's embarrassing. Yeah. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I have a I have a question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm curious, how much does this theory depend on the usual version of the axiom of choice, as opposed to perhaps some weaker version, such as dependent or, or countable choice? Because it I seems think, that like even the notion of compact, totally disconnected Hausdorff space seems, it feels very choicey with stuff like stone check. Well, it's, it's more the extremely disconnected ones that feel really choicey, or the right. fact that the projective is basically equivalent to the axiom of choice. I mean, I think the full axiom of choice is, is right in the foundations of this whole uh -huh. thing. You could try to avoid it by passing to some dual perspective of, of uh, complete Boolean algebras and working there, but it's not at all clear to me that we know what, what would work in that setting, what would right. Right, right, right. Okay, I see, yeah. I'll think about it. Thanks. Sure. Uh, I have a very vague question. Yes. Um, I'm interested in phenomenal algebras. Phenomenal algebras here are usually defined over fields of actually zero, right? Real numbers, complex numbers. I have the impression that some version of phenomenal algebras in the FP setting is lurking in the background, very far away. Is this a chance that one, if one takes your um, way, it's more serious that you, that you can see something there? It's very vague, I know, but uh, it would be really great if you could do that. Well, Norman algebra is like a non-commutative analog of the L infinity space, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess. Uh, or maybe easier for C algebra if you're more comfortable with that. Yeah. So that's. It's a, I think it's an actual. It's. It's a somewhat interesting question. For me, these analogies are not quite so strong, uh, maybe because I just don't understand enough. But so can we see it? Yeah, so again, commutative C star algebras are, of course, just compact house for spaces. Exactly, exactly. And so here's a funny, <laughs> but you, you see, and then you can, well, for a compact house for space, that means you can encode it in a, in, a, in a functional analysis way, sort of continuous functions with values in complex numbers. Mm -hmm. Now, here's a funny thing. You cannot you know, encode it in continuous functions with values in FP. Uh, of course, there aren't, there aren't going to be enough of those. Or even ZP, there aren't, or QP, there just aren't going to be enough of those. However, if you pass to a profinite set, then, then there are enough. And then you can recover this completely from even just the you know, FP, continuous functions with values in FP. And then you can use this descent business and you can see that uh, your, your compact cluster of space is recovered from basically some stack, uh, I don't know. And this is essentially what uh, Peter did in his diamond setting in the non, well, one, one small remark he made in this diamonds paper, a tall cohomology of diamonds in the, in the perfectoid set. That, because a compact house door space is locally profile, you can always view it as some kind of stack. Um, so then, I mean, I don't know. So these kinds of rings are, I guess they're kind of von, von Neumann regular rings is the appropriate non-commutative analog of these. So a compact house door space is some kind of stack on in von Neumann regular rings. So that, okay. I don't know. I don't know if any of these <laughs> remarks are helpful to you, but they're about the only things I know. No, uh, and you mean really for normal and regular, not regular. You know, for normal and regular means that x, y, or x is a solution. There's always a confusion. There's a notion of regular ring. No, I mean, normal regular. regular ring. Yes. Oh, that's, in, uh, that's, that's of course at least interesting. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, well, I should take p equals two, I suppose. Uh, I, okay, don't, don't take necessary. I, yeah, I, yeah, my. Some kind of stack in one number. I don't know. I, I really don't know. I was just saying things. <laughs> well, no, it was a big question, but it was interesting. Maybe one remark I can make is that I think one way these von Neumann algebras appear in your work is as some kind of group algebras, right? Yeah. And then in the corresponding periodic theory, there are these Ivasava algebras appearing. And the Ivasava algebras, they are actually the free solid rings on profinite groups in our setting. I'm not sure if there's any helpful remark, but. Yeah, it is interesting because we have used Ibazawa algebras when we wanted to get approximation also for FP coefficient. Of course, this I'm after, right, finally. But of course, then I have to learn more about what you're doing there, but this is also an interesting uh, thing. But we have used baby versions, right? It's clear. So <laughs> for some uh, reductive groups, you could do something of, if you map to GLN, QP or whatsoever, we could do some approximations by using the Ivazawa algebra because it's a very nice algebra 
test and has nice features, which right. are close to phenomenal algebra. Okay, but thank you. Actually, just, yeah. just the last week on archives, there appeared some paper by Rodriguez Camargo and Rodriguez Garcia Sinto or something. I'm not sure I have the right names. Um, who read it's a series of local analytic representations, Eva Zava algebras, and so on, from the point of view of solid, uh, solid modules. Last week, thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions? All right, so if not, let's thank Dustin again. Um, wait, 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 wait. Okay, sorry. Yeah, it's like a bit, it takes a bit longer in the physical world. Uh, uh, one easy question when you said in the bit because you said something about one parameter, what, what does this mean exactly? Oh, well, that just means that the, the kernel of this map from bit vectors of K to K. Uh, is generated by a single non-zero divisor. Okay, that okay, makes sense. Yeah, so it looks it, it, it looks kind of like a formal power series or even one variable, except not really. <laughs> okay. And another thing, so we saw that so if you have a CW complex and take a free condensed abelian group on it and solidify, we somehow see the homology. I was wondering what happens if you replace Z with a sphere or a spectrum, like what, what comes out of that? Uh, uh, yeah, you just get the suspension spectrum of the sort of homotopy type of the CW complex. Yeah. Okay, nice. Yeah. Don't know the mic is still being transferred in the Max Planck room. It's it's done. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, so let's like dust it again finally. Wonderful talk. <laughs>